Okay, um, um, I'm very happy to be here. I mean, it's been, a, and one of my programs is called Journey to Work. Well, it's been a, quite a journey to get to my work. Uh, I started uh, two days ago, uh, snow. Uh, did you uh, see the movie Die Hard 2? <laughs> Something like that, without the crashing planes. Um, and uh, I even, nah, uh, I had a room, luckily enough. But uh, okay, I will uh, present to you today uh, about uh, getting in connection with the labor market, with the employability. Um, I put on this picture uh, about um, yeah, the difficulty of getting a job. And uh, I guess that everybody here is an expert on the, uh, I believe, the in recovery um, sector. Am I right? And um, I think that what I'm going to do here today is try to um, give a um, bit of a, 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 a talk about what you need to do to get a successful employability project. So, um, um, and I think there are three core elements um, which I'm going to tell you. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of a cliffhanger. Um, my um, things I'm doing in Europe is uh, all about uh, youth entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship in general, employability, mobility projects, social inclusion and social innovation. And last but not least, you see I have a pretty loud social media presence. Um, so you can follow me on Twitter. I don't know if people follow, uh, do use Twitter, but I have a Twitter thread, which is actually giving you information while I'm speaking. So. Uh, mobile phones allowed, uh, I will not say anything about it. So sometimes if I tell something about uh, the American uh, 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 tactics or approaches, I actually have posted an article on the Twitter thread and you can read it in a more uh, easy way and it's, it's better explained. So I thought that would be a, a good idea. Um, so um, you can easily find it by using the event hashtag. So then you will probably get into my trail right away. Um, I also know that um, I have to do something uh, to make it more easy for you guys. Oh, it's up. It's the oh yeah, there it is. So uh, because I am a bit uh, long in my, uh, my monologues, um, I have made a, a, a slide which is going very quickly. So this is my 30 minute speech in 45 seconds. <laughs> so just to, to get rid of it, so everything I will say today is in here. You can go and tap on freeze and then you can read it as easy as you want, just in your own speed. Um, I will talk about um, the Dutch unemployment rate. I will talk about the core elements of getting people into employability from a European perspective, but also from a Dutch perspective. I will talk about how local, regional and national policies uh, will work or will not work. I will talk about practical and logical reasoning. I think that sometimes we are doing two difficult things. Play again. I'm not gonna play it again. We're gonna go back to my original slideshow and we start from the current slide so we've done that I think before uh, we go into all this heavy stuff about employability I think it's good that we have a little bit of an icebreaker so I think if you want to get to know more about me you need to know more about Dutch culture so I'm gonna tell something about uh, the difference uh, between Holland and the Netherlands I know this is really bugging you all. So I'm going to explain today. And I hope it's not the only thing you will remember of my speech, but okay. Then I think it's also important that we are going to stress today that in recovery is that I see that a lot of people are very proud of being in recovery, but I want to stress that they're also un unemployed. It's the same thing like you're a young person and you graduate from university and everybody's proud, but it's also the first day of unemployment. So that is probably the same start of people in recovery. That's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about a digital professional identity, which is very important for people in recovery, for everybody. And I'm going to talk about 
the future of work and what skills you need. But this is me. If I'm going to explain what I'm doing, it's going to take a long while. So you only have to remember employability, entrepreneurship, social media savvy. And this is my picture. This picture is everywhere. And this picture I will explain later because something is happening with my digital professional identity and it sort of says that I'm also a football player. I wanted to become a professional football player, but this is what I got. Okay, uh, we have somewhere hidden a video. Let's see if I can find it. Welcome to the great nation of Holland, where the tulips grow, the windmills turn, the breakfast is chocolatey, the people industrious, and the sea tries to drown it all. Except this country isn't Holland. It's time for the difference between Holland, the Netherlands, and a whole lot more. The correct name for this tulip growing, windmill building, Hagoslag eating, container ship moving, ocean conquering nation is the Netherlands. But confusion is understandable. The general region has been renamed a lot over a thousand years, including as the Dutch Republic, the United States of Belgium, and the Kingdom of Holland. But it's not just history that makes this country's name confusing, because the Netherlands is divided into 12 provinces. Groningen, Trenta, Overhessel, Helderland, Limburg, Noord, Brabant, Zeeland, which by the way is the Zeeland that makes this Zeeland new, Friesland with adorable little hearts on its flags, Flevoland, Utrecht, and here's the confusion, Noord, North Holland, and Zuid, South Holland. These provinces make calling the Netherlands Holland like calling the United States Dakota. Though unlike the Dakotas, which are mostly empty save for the occasional jackalope, the two Hollands are the most populated provinces and have some of the biggest attractions like Amsterdam and Kokenhof. Chances are, if it's Dutch and you've heard of it, it's in one of the Hollands. Even the government's travel website for the country is Holland.com, officially because it sounds friendlier, but unofficially it's probably what people are actually searching for. Confusion continues because people who live in the Hollands are called Hollanders, but all citizens of the Netherlands are called Dutch, as is their language. But in Dutch, they say Nederlands, sprekende Nederlanders, and Nederland, which sounds like they'd rather we call them Netherlanders, speaking Netherlandish. Meanwhile, next door in Germany, they're Deutsche Sprechen Deutsch in Deutschland, which sounds like they'd rather be called Dutch. This linguistic confusion is why Americans call the Pennsylvania Dutch Dutch, even though they're Germans. To review, this country is the Netherlands, its people are Dutch, and they speak Dutch. There is no country called Holland, but there are provinces of North and South Holland. Got it? Okay, we go back from my... Uh... Also, um, you can uh, watch a Prezi presentation, which is uh, nicer, uh, which will tell a little bit about uh, uh, the Dutch Foundation, for which I work uh, as a consultant. I have a, a company in Scotland, which is called Works of Scotland. And this is a bit the entrepreneurial thing we Dutch do. I was looking around a bit here in Scotland, and I found out that every company is called Scottish or Scotland or so I was thinking if I have to get into Scotland I have to mention uh, something about Scotland so that's why my company is called works in the Scotland it worked by the way <laughs> so uh, now we get to the point of the unemployment the unemployment rate of the Netherlands uh, it, it's a good thing uh, to state that you Scottish are doing better at this point uh, I think at this point you're outperforming the rest of the UK and your uh, unemployment rate is a little bit lower than ours. But I want to make a point here. Uh, this is the, the green line. You see this one. This is the Dutch over two decades or more, which states more or less <laughs> that we are low with our un unemployment rate for a long time. And we have not so high peaks, uh, we just stay low all of the time. Uh, I couldn't find a, a pick with, with the UK or Scotland, but it, it makes a point that what we are doing in Holland is pretty interesting. Uh, and I'm not saying what I'm telling here today is something you have to do. It's just saying that probably what I'm telling here today, uh, I mean, you already know. I mean, uh, some stuff we already do here in the UK or in Scotland, or has been done somewhere else. And we just did something which was called uh, Work First. And I think you actually have a disability employment program called Work First now. And, and we have been doing this since 2004, and it still has a very huge impact on uh, our um, employability programs. Um, so I'm going to explain why we lead the pack um, uh, up till now. And I'm going to try to make it uh, as logical as possible uh, explaining this. 
Um, I think there is always a few things which you have to keep in mind. Always the individual approach. I mean, the person who has to get into employment, the person who has recovered, but now stands to enter society, as we think is normal. Uh, the person who has to enter the labor market. Uh, then we have the plan of the organization or the government. And then we also have the employers, the labor market. So there are three perspectives, and uh, it's clear that we have to make a chemistry between those three to get it work. So are you recovered and proud? Are you graduated and happy about that? But both of them are unemployed. We need to make sure that our plan or your plan is a very good plan. And do we need a local, a national or a regional strategy? I think we need to look at the regions we have and we need to look what kind of jobs there are. It's very important. Do we need a one size fits all strategy or a tailor made strategy? And why does an entrepreneurial system work so well? I'm going to explain it in the slide. And, but first I want to start with the core elements because I don't want to keep you waiting that long about what is very important. Uh, what we did is um, I, I looked at a lot of projects in Europe and what we see is that there are always three core elements coming back to successful employability projects. Um, and I also say that going on study visits, just have a look somewhere else is really good. It really gives you inspiration. It gives you a good feel of what you are doing yourself and what other people are doing and you can compare it. And it's also clear that you cannot just copy stuff and put it in Scotland and then it works. No, you have to look at it, uh, transform it, paste it, but then to the local regional environment. Because, I mean, this is, this is not a very uh, innovative thing to say, but we see with a lot of projects which fail is that it's not fine-tuned. We just do it because it works somewhere else and we don't think about the region or we don't think about the stakeholders who have to implement it. And culture. I mean, what works in, in one culture doesn't always work in another culture. So that is the things we need to uh, think about. Uh, I can say now for that I, I'm not so good at a lot of things, but I'm good at networking and I'm good at picking things up and put it somewhere else and explaining what works and what doesn't work. So just keep that in mind. What is good also to know is that every employability project has to have work, work experience in it. This sounds like really stupid, you know, but there are a lot of programs which don't have any work experience in it, which is really totally amazing that that program will not have a good success rate. It will fail all of the time. I mean, you can let people practice, but you also have to give them more than that. You have to actually let them do it because from work to work, that's the way it works. You have to keep that in mind. I mean, it's not that difficult. You also have to keep in mind that you are experts of getting people out of addiction into recovery, right? And you also have to acknowledge that maybe, or for sure, you're not the employability expert. The fact only to acknowledge that is already an advantage for the person you are guiding or to get them into the labor market. We need to know what the core expertise is of the people you are going to get into the labor market. One of the things which was really interesting is that uh, Chris went on to uh, a study visit to the Netherlands, uh, which was called Elevate, and uh, a lot of other uh, organizations also went. I think Phoenix Features and what was it? Um, so uh, they, they came and they had a look at uh, our uh, uh, programs, uh, also getting to, into employability uh, from addiction in recovery to employability. And, and one of the things which was very interesting, which I now use, is that Chris said, well, uh, sort of the Dutch use work as a treatment. I said, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think that what sometimes what, what goes wrong with a lot of uh, care programs or uh, getting people out of problems into employment is that we think we have to really make them job ready and then we start. In Holland, what we do is we just already let them work also. 
next to the programs they also need to do. We let them work because we already know then, if they wreck it, that we need to maybe adjust or anticipate a little bit. So it's always good to already start doing things and you can use also employers, but just say to the employer, hey, listen, um, he's not job ready-ish yet, but can you give him a chance? And so the, the, the employer will know that it's not uh, somebody who will be really gonna be productive or really gonna put the results down in a few weeks. That will give you a lot of room to play with the individual who has to be getting back into the work uh, environment and also with the employer who thinks, okay, everything he does oh, is better than nothing. And sometimes we want to push people too early. On, the, on this uh, uh, website, you can see a lot of uh, um, examples of good practices. And also, uh, I think from, from Romania to Spain to Italy, also Scotland, um, Netherlands, Ireland, uh, you can have a look and you can see for yourself what kind of um, programs uh, worked. Uh, I also think that um, we need to think about how to use the work bit. Um, in the Netherlands, what we always do is we try, uh, or, or my principle is that if somebody works, you have to pay him a little bit more than what he would have gotten in benefit. Because I think that work I mean, if you don't get paid, why would he take it seriously? So it's also a mindset. If you start an employability program, and I know we, we, uh, you need to have a budget, it's clear to me. But try to reward people who are working or who are getting into an employability program because it is a stimulus. And you don't have to go through the whole of conversation like, oh, so, so, okay, why, why am, am I going to do this? Why? Uh, for me, I don't get paid. Why? Why? So, so, so you avoid this kind of conversation just by saying, okay, you, you also get a little bit paid. So th this is a good incentive. Incentive. Also, uh, we have to think about the work we provide. I would not prefer to give them work which is simulation. Uh, uh, if if people know it's not real work, they will act upon it. They will not perform well. I have seen in the Netherlands work experience, work, work experience placements, which were, well, I mean, I got ill myself. I mean, I saw somebody sitting on the desk, uh, picking up the phone twice a day, and that was it. And he, I saw a meeting and lunch, and I mean, um, there was no activity. And, and the, the, the thing what should be very dominant in getting people back into the employability back onto the labor market is that the work ingredient is high. So people are active and they're actually tired if they come from their work experience, from their work. So uh, I also say that it has to be a one size fits all at the beginning. So, and then I mean that we all have norms and values, right? So there's a normal framework. So if somebody does anything which is out of the order, ah, you have to be harsh. You have to kick them out, kick them out of the program. Why? If you're going to accept that, it's not normal. I mean, you have to, they're not job ready. Kick them out of the program. And we all say, oh, oh yeah, but it's, they are not ready. You need to see, always look at what is happening in society and what do we accept? If you were a, a colleague of mine, would I accept that you would, uh, take long breaks and, 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 and don't do your work and yeah, oh yeah, but he has problems. We, we wouldn't accept it and then, uh, or don't show up, he would get fired yeah, at a certain point. So I also think that that should be, you should make a really strong case about that. And of course we give people second chances. You have to give people second chances or third chances. But if you don't set a framework, uh, it's going to be very hard to get them back into the labor market. The last thing on this slide, everybody can do something. This is actually true. The only problem is probably if you're young, but also if you have been out of the labor market for a long time, is that you maybe don't know what you actually can do, except you know probably a lot of innovative ways to get something. You have probably a lot of problem solving skills to get what you want. So if you can figure out, if the person can figure out 
what he can do to use those skills on the labor market, we already have an advantage. <coughs> and this is something which should be a relationship thing going on between the, the, the coach and the person, the individual, getting back into the labor market. Another thing which is very important, effective networking. Um, this is also something which is probably pretty clear. Um, there are a lot of programs which doesn't have functioning networks. So people are not communicating well. They don't do things in the same manner. So uh, just what I said, like if, if I would say uh, this is out of the order, he should go back, we should, we should quit. And then the other one, oh no, we, we should keep him in. And so you have then different views about how you would you know, target somebody into the labor market. Uh, we, we should be clear from the start, also with the political back background, so that people know that if you're gonna <laughs> get mothers with children into the labor market, that if they go to the, to the politicians, that we all stand firm that this is what we have decided and we're gonna go this way. And if we're not gonna do it, we're gonna make exemptions already before we start, the network is not working. Also, we need to think about the individual network. So we have to, probably the network the individuals have are broken, usually, or they don't know how to use the network. So we need to coach them and we need to show them how to use the network. And maybe we have to lend our network to get them somewhere. Because um, a lot of jobs are not uh, being filled by actually uh, apply for the job, but are actually going indirect. So a lot of jobs are already filled by the network of somebody from the football club who knows somebody else. And then, so this is something which could be an advantage if we do it well. Um, um, and we should reward them. So this is why I say a network without, I know you, you guys know the job club thing. This is, is, this is already has some, um, you already have an ID with job club, right? I, I, I don't mean that job club. So it means it has to be a voluntary job club. It has to be that you go to the job club to help yourself, not because it's mandatory to go to the job club. But I, I guess that if people come back from addiction and they're recovered and they're proud that they are eager to get back. So they want to get this network going and they want to do the things they have to do. Very important, quality coaching. Every successful program had quality coaching. This is again not something which is out of the ordinary, but um, we need to look at what happened with the person. And one of the things which I think is, I'm not saying it's, it's only in Scotland, uh, I'm saying it's, it's a lot, uh, it's very dominant in the care sector, is that people take over. So somebody has a problem and they take over from the individual and he's just waiting for you to solve the problem. And if it goes wrong, he's pointing at you. We need to be sure that if they are entering the labor market, they can solve their own problems. We only support them solving that problem. I know people who actually had a system that they knew when they said something, the case manager was running and he was just waiting for her or for him to do what he wanted her to, to do. And then he got it. And if he didn't got it, he just, you know, like an annoying child, just get what you want. And it worked for him. And I, I had a talk about him with him. And he said, oh yeah, yeah, but this is how it works. And it works for me. And we need to think about how we can change this, how we can let them work to get their own job. So, own responsibility. Responsibility to solve your own problems. And the trust and confidence bit. Um, this is trust and confidence um, you only get by building a relationship. And I know, uh, I mean, we are complaining a lot about Job Center Plus, but okay, let, let's, let's be clear. I mean, they don't have the time and the money to have a conversation every week and then again, a one hour conversation. You're not gonna build any trust or confidence with your client. So I think that if you invest in a relationship, you will also get him 
get to know him and also know what will trigger him into the labor market. And maybe this is a bit, bit costly, but I do think that this is the only way to get people into the labor market by building good relationships. So I go back. I go back from an individual point of view to a regional or local point of view. I have talked with a lot of case managers, a lot of people from um, um, uh, employability organizations. And if I ask them, I mean, how many unemployed people do you have? They just tell me the statistics. And if I ask them, how many jobs are there? They don't know. It's the basic, it's a basic thing. We need to know what kind of jobs are there in your region. And what we see here is that Scotland has almost 200K, no, 2 million jobs, right? 2 million jobs. And you're outperforming the rest of the UK. So you're doing a really good job. But that also means that we need to think already about the future. So probably now the best are already going into the labor market. So what you have left are probably more difficult people or more difficult people to get into the labor market, to get into jobs. So it means that the successful programs you have right now probably needs to change a bit because it will not happen that the same program will work with a different target group. We need to think about it. It's logic reasoning. You always have to fine tune your programs and you have to be spot on when to change it. And it's always harsh. It's always hard to change if it's still successful, but you have to be on the right moment to change stuff because things change. These kind of jobs have been coming into the jobs market since 2010. And this is happening on the labor market. So you see that a lot of people are starting their own business. You see that there is a change in employment. You see that there's a change in numbers and work. And you see also that there's a change in, in activity, which is going the wrong way. What kind of businesses are located in Scotland? Right corner. You don't have the most businesses. What kind of businesses are really here in Glasgow? I, I, I'm, I'm at the hotel and at the opposite is the SSE. And there's a lot of green jobs and they're doing a, they want to make, build an economic hub for the renewable energy industry. So if you want a job in that industry, you can get the job here. But do we have unemployed people? Do we have people in recovery capable of doing this? This is the question. Are they skilled enough to get into this industry? If not, maybe we have to relocate them. What kind of un unemployment do we have? What talents are we looking for? These are the, the 10 vacancies. These are the 10 uh, branches where they are looking for people. I mean, it's also clear that a few of them are very, very, very uh, difficult. Uh, it's also clear that if you can do this job, you're set and you also have a high pay. But we need to know how many people are actually capable of doing this. I mean, I can construction, hotel catering, IT computing. I mean, there are a lot of uh, couch potatoes who are maybe doing PlayStation or Xbox. Okay, they will, it's, not, it's not clear that they then can do IT and computing. That's, that's, that's for sure. But there are a few who actually can do something with hardware or can do something with software. And we need to find that out. It's our job. It's our job to find the skills they have. And it's their job to <coughs> actually using it. Also to make a point about the future of work is that we had Jobs, we have jobs now which didn't exist like 10 years ago. I mean, 
driverless car engineer, uh, Uber driver, I mean, nobody. I, I think that drone operator, sustainability manager. And what is important to know that seven out of 10 jobs are related to services jobs. So that means you need problem solving skills to get into, into those jobs. And which is also clear is they're not gonna be robotized. So this is something where we can work with. Going back to the plan. Uh, this is a Dutch picture, uh, bike, flat. So this is a pretty easy plan. Um, I, I, I want to talk about, um, I did a study visit to uh, South Africa and I went to visit Robert Island where Mandela was uh, held prisoner for what, 30 years or something. And I had a really, really interesting um, tour uh, this guy uh, was in prison himself for 25 years. So it was really, you know, getting into the heart. Um, and uh, because I'm Dutch, uh, I also, uh, you know, ask uh, stupid questions. Uh, so I asked the guy, I said, oh, listen, uh, so, so, so you've been in prison for uh, 25 years. And I said, yes, yes, yes. And, and now you're, you're the guide. Isn't that... Uh, ah bit odd that you're like guiding on the island you have been in prison for 25 years and, and I hear you also live here now <laughs> and it went completely silent and I was like oh. <laughs> and he said well you're the first guy who have ever asked this to me so uh, uh, but he said oh listen he said uh, the first three weeks it was yeah it was strange but hey I need to get a job. I need to, you know, make a living. And actually, I feel comfortable now. I'm, I can tell what happened here. It should not be happening again. And he was, very, and he was already inspiring him during the tour. But um, the, the whole idea of this, why, I'm this, why am I telling this, is that sometimes it can be very obvious what we can do with the expertise somebody has. Now, it's clear that everybody who has been addicted cannot be a care worker. I mean, that's totally out of the question, but some of them can. But what I just said, I mean, they probably had innovative skills <coughs> to get what they wanted. So they probably can also use that in a new job. So this is what we have to think about. How can we use the skills to get into this job? And how can we get them there? Now, I want to talk to you about um, this um, great law. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to tell you another story. A story about that when everybody knew that this act was going to be implemented in 2004, <coughs> everybody was a bit like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, this is new, this is pretty new, what are we going to do? So and we had a, a national body uh, who said, okay, in 1996 in America, there's a program, it's called Wisconsin Works, it's called Work First. So let's go on study visit and look what they are doing. And this is actually, I think that 26 study visits with 20 people went to America, like for two, three years. And the good thing about this program was, I mean, the, those Americans are a little bit uh, strange. And they're pretty, uh, if they want something, <coughs> they do it, right? They just fire everybody and they, they start a new program, which is totally not doable in the UK or in the Netherlands. It's not doable. But the one problem they don't have is cultural, cultural change. They don't have to change the culture of the people who are doing everything for a decade already, and they need to change their ways because the law changes, because they say, I, I, I've been doing this for 10 years, so it works, why, why would I change? And they said, just said, okay, listen, you can apply for your job again, but if you don't do this job like we want you to do it, we're not going to hire you. You're just one of the unemployed, which is pretty harsh, but it's good for the mind shift. I looked at what they did, <coughs> and they had, in a one-year time, they had a 50% reduction of benefits. It's 
crazy. Um, what I also saw that were that the training facilities were almost empty, which was a bit of odd. So I, I didn't think that people were trained. I, I just they just put in a, a gate and nobody got in anymore. But uh, it, it gave them a lot of money. But what they also did, they rewarded the case managers. So if a case manager did very well and his caseload went down, he get bonuses. And if he didn't do well, he was on the other side and he was unemployed. This is, hmm. So the system which was working there was pretty interesting. So of course I asked, or maybe not I, but it's just for the story it's better I ask it. Um, for, um, so so what, what goes wrong? Uh, and these Americans like, uh, what goes wrong? I, I just told you uh, it's the best system ever. Look at the statistics. We don't have any statistics of things going wrong. What's the use? And that is, of course, a bit stupid eh, in our minds. But then again, I've, I've been thinking about it. I, why make it difficult for yourself and starting with saying things that go wrong? Just emphasize on the things that go right. So if you start an employability program, maybe don't start with the hardest ones. Start with the people who are actually where you think, okay, they are ready for it. Because that will make sure that you have success. And from success, you can also see there is a sort of um, um, strange ingredient that if people see this successful, I want to go to this successful program because then I, I'm going to be successful. So there's something which people want to belong to. And this is also which you can actually plan and which you actually can make work. You can make it work. So this is something which we learned from the Americans. Um, I have put in the Twitter thread, in the Twitter thread uh, an article about this, which is very interesting read. Uh, I wrote it myself. Um, uh, and, and we'll explain more. But now I'm, I'm going to the institutional framework of the Work and Social Assistance Act. Um, what was good about this act, this was an entrepreneurial act. So what you had, and I tried to explain in the most simple way, not because uh, because I got it and only in a few months, so I, I'm trying to explain it here in, in one minute. Uh, <laughs> um, so what you have, you have a budget for benefits and you have a budget for people getting into employment. They gave like, say, six million for the benefits. And if the benefits went down, you could keep what was left over. Then you had a budget for getting people in, in employment like say three million. And if you used it to employment programs, it was labeled right. If you didn't use it, you had to give it back. So if municipalities, which is a sort of a equal to councils, didn't use this money, they had to give three million back. And if the benefits went up and they only had six million and it cost them seven million, they had to one, pay one million out of their own pocket. So this is a sort of a business, what was happening. So people had to, municipalities had to act as businesses. And this is maybe something, I'm, I'm going to say something maybe a bit out of the ordinary, but hey, I'm Dutch, so. Um, uh, you also have it sometimes with charities, right? Because they are non-profit. And from non-profit, sometimes, I mean, you have to stay there, but because you don't want, you don't make a profit, that's a different way of, organizing a company or making things work or getting results than if you're a business. Because if you're a business and you go broke, you're out. And I'm, I'm not saying that money is, that's, I mean, that it's not it. But the, the, the mindset of having this entrepreneurial framework made that the results went down, down, and down. So, if we look at, this, is, this was my own municipality, and it, ha it went 50% down in like five years. And we started with the best of the best. But we also changed the system when you saw that the best of the best were getting out into the labor market. So I needed to adjust the system, otherwise people kept into the system because it didn't work anymore. What we did is we didn't do, we did do a one size fits all strategy, but if they were in, uh, I mean, not everybody wants to make life hammers, 
So we also had innovative social products. We let people start up their own business. I mean, this is also something. I mean, getting into employability is not only try to get into a job, it can also be starting a business. Uh, sometimes we forget that. Uh, so we had like big programs. Oh, do I go the wrong way? Uh, this, is, this is the works of the model. Uh, actually, a German guy explained this. So, uh, you know, I need people who explain what I'm saying uh, a lot of the time. So, here you see in one picture uh, what was happening in all the municipalities in different variations. So, uh, you guys know uh, Work for the Dole in Australia? Do you know that concept? So, they only have one work first, one size fits all strategy for everybody. The good thing about that is that you can really uh, compare statistics. You know what's, what works and what doesn't work. They even had a five-star model. So um, if companies did well, they get five stars. If they did bad, one star, company out. And they went doing that, they had 2,000 service providers and in the end they only had 200. So <laughs> it was more heavy for the service providers than for the clients getting from unemployment into employment. But this one was that you see there's a very narrow entrance. So this is the one size fits all strategy <coughs> that you need to get people in, but only in a certain way. They have to show up, they have to give information, and they have to, what we always did is we gave them a job. And the job was a little bit higher than the benefit, and if they refused, then we say, why? We give you a job, you're unemployed. And from there, if they were in, if they accepted the job, we gave them different kind of work to do. Because I also think that this is not an actual location. It was, but it could also be that they were located with an employer or were uh, landed out. So, so this, and then from the subsidized job, they went to the big exit, went to the regular job. Am I over my time? Way over my time. Uh, <laughs> great. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do is, uh, I told you about this. So these, are the, these were the five young people. It's been a good practice in 2006, 2012. Um, that's already a long time ago, but um, the um, models we set up were different in each location. So if we had, were in a, in a heavy industry, we had a different production than if we were in a logistic industry. I mean, it makes sense, but a lot of people just pick up and do the same thing somewhere else. It doesn't work like that. You need to know what the labor market is asking and that's what you have to prepare people for. You can read this, I mean, it's pretty clear that a lot of this stuff, if you read it, you know what you, you have to do. But I wanna say something about the zero hour contracts. I, I know that some Scottish uh, woman said something in, in parliament about zero hour contracts. Um, the zero hour contracts are okay if it's rewarding. So it's good that if you don't show up and you don't have a good reason, you're not ill, you just don't showing up that you don't get paid. I think that's a good thing about a zero hour contract. If you don't have any good reason or any good argument, why should you pay? I mean, that's not normal, right? Certainly, if you start, who is going to start a new job and then in the first month doesn't show up and thinks he's going to keep the job? I mean, we have to be clear about that. But if they show up and make hours, they should pay, get paid more. And if they do it for a long time, then the zero hour contract should be firm, should be tight. Because then you have, uh, how you say that, build up history from 30, year, 30 hours working a week. So that should be then not a zero hour contract anymore. It should be transferred into a 30 hour contract. I just wanna tell you that this project has been you know, uh, denied in 2004 for the first time, but we went on and we tried to do it everywhere and everywhere it had very high ratings. Then it was a local one. We tried to develop it to regional, national, and then we started by doing it in Europe. So actually at this moment, I am doing the journey to work projects with Scottish young people or Scottish people till 30 years old, I think even 35, that's still young, and uh, getting them um, from Scotland into the Netherlands, let them work for six weeks, 
upgrade their CV, but also that we can watch them not only working, but also in social life. Because I think that a lot of stuff we don't see, we will see by intensive projects. Also how they relate to family, also to neighbors or to on the work. And also if they go uh, have a, uh, a normal breakfast or they go out or what, what they, do they do in their free time? If we get a really good idea of what they're doing, we know also better what they have to do to get into steady uh, employment. So uh, you also see that I've learned from uh, Sylvester Stallone is that uh, you just have to, you know, work on uh, Rambo 1, 2, Rocky 1, 2, 3, 4. So Journey to Work, uh, I mean, it works. So that's why I said uh, we are now uh, going to write Journey to Work 5. Uh, you can uh, read more about it. Uh, I think that the most important thing is that the intensity of the Journey to Work project empowers. And that also that because they come into a new environment, that the development they make in six weeks is probably something that you cannot do here in a year. And also the fact, and certainly for people in recovery, they have a history. So if they do something good, everybody says, oh yeah, it's about time. But if they do something good in Holland, just people say, because they don't know the history, like, hey, well done. And then you see, the, uh, oh, thanks. You know? <laughs> so, so it's also that the new surrounding makes that people have a fresh start. We also need to be aware that a fresh start is not like try to be someone else. It's just be who you are. I, I, sometimes I do a group setting and then I say, okay, what kind of job you want to do? I'm not going to do it with you guys because it's a bit embarrassing, I think, if everybody doesn't want to do the job he's doing now. Uh, but the third question is, and this is where it all uh, comes to, do you want to be happy? And then everybody goes to the place where you are happy. And so the job is a means to an end means to be happy, to provide for your family, to provide for yourself, to have a, a, a home, to, to, to buy food. So it's not always that you can get the dream job you want on day one. It's about, you know, entering society, entering the labor market, and it doesn't really matter, just be active, just work, because then you feel better, and from there you get a better job. This is how we all do it. So this is also how people in recovery should do it, and being proud to get the job and to do the job, accomplish that, and then reaching full potential because they're also eager to do, to do better, to show that they are back. I think the other things are, uh, speak for themselves. Um, you can read it. Uh, I mean, this is your life and this kind of stuff. I mean, it's clear you can read it, but it's not, it's about, this is the individual journey. People have to look what they want, but it's not, I mean, do what you love. Come on, you're, you're just back, so get a job. And then try to go to the job, to the job you love. I mean, that, that's also what I think we should take uh, in consideration. This uh, stuff is that the, the coaching of the, should be of high quality. I mean, we should know our client. We should know how they, what kind of route they took, where they are now. We should know that. And we should also know that if they're going into employment, that they also will have some setbacks. I mean, it's not like, it's like everybody else who's doing a job search. I mean, you will not get a job straight away and then you will also have this kind of stuff. And we, as a coach, should just make sure that people are not giving up. I mean, that is our job. It's our job to make sure that they get on top and my plan our plan and the reality we all know them all right this is normal this is how it goes in life so i also think that it's very important that uh, we all have a brand and it's called the brand i we are all i am unique everybody is unique so be aware who you are and also disseminate that we also have to, I mean, I am not sure, I'm not, I, I, I did not figure it out yet. Should you be, if you're in recovery, right, and you're proud, should you shout it out? I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, okay, everybody's, I think there is a sort of culture here that everybody really applauds for that, uh, gives applause. 
um, uh, is cheering for that. But then, the employer, does he want somebody who just came back from addiction? We need to work on the image. You need to think about, okay, how am I going to launch myself into the labor market? And you have to build your own image. Not lie about your past, but rebuild your image. Make sure that if you're on social media, that they know what you're doing in your neighborhood, that you also have a, I mean, if you're gonna look for me, it's all the same picture. And you also see a little bit of blue. You see, I'm wearing something blue. So you know it's me. A lot of women use a lot of other pictures uh, because it's nice, and, uh, but nobody understands that it's the same you. So make sure that if you are trying to enter the labor market, that the picture is good. Um, that's why I also have a seven elements of a chill picture. You have to watch this video because this video is about, this is from Peter Hurley, he's an American photographer, and he says that you have to squinch with your eyes. If you squinch, you look much better. <laughs> you have to watch this, it's, it's really, it's hilarious. Uh, but it actually works, so all, you know, all the famous people, they squinch. And if you squinch, and uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do one example for you guys. Uh, yeah, we haven't. So he's smiling with teeth, great. Uh, dark color suits, oh well, yeah. Uh, ah, no buttons, so. Jawline with a shadow, yep. Uh, head and shoulders, good stuff. Um, squinch, yeah. <laughs> what is also interesting that the men and the women have different ways of making a selfie. So the men should be like this and the women should be a little bit different and should not be sexy. I will also post it how it should be. Um, I hope uh, I uh, gave you some uh, thoughts to think about. I hope you like what I was uh, presenting. And uh, if there are any questions, you can uh, fire them off now.